Hi everyone! In this video, we're going to cover the topic of algebra. Now, algebra can have a bunch of different categories and classifications, but in today's video in particular, we're going to be looking at the category called numbers and algebra. Now, within that category, we're looking at the classification of algebra and determining unknowns. So what this means is that these specific questions, so algebra determining unknown questions, is going to involve questions where numbers are represented Presented by generic symbols or letters. Students may need to rewrite the equation provided into an appropriate question where the unknown values are represented by letters. Students may then use multiple equations to solve the unknown value through substitution, addition or transformation of the equation simultaneously. Harder questions may involve square numbers or simultaneous equations. Okay, so before we actually get into it, based on what we've just read about what algebraic questions involve, is that they're basically puzzle solving questions. You're going to be given a unknown. So you're going to be figuring out something that isn't quite told to us directly in the question using all the clues and hints provided. So usually the letter that we use the most in algebra tend to be the letters X and Y. Now I'm not totally sure why mathematicians decided on those letters specifically, but they are quite common. And it's not limited to those letters because technically you can use any letter of the English al alphabet, sometimes even the Greek alphabet will be appearing in algebraic um, questions. Now the type of letter used doesn't really matter because all they are at the end of the day are just a symbol that we use to represent something that we don't know. Because when we start out with algebra, when we are beginners in algebra, some questions might look like this, where we have three plus square is equal to five. And we can clearly tell that the square is equal to two because three plus two is equal to five. But as questions get more difficult, uh, squares can be a bit limiting in the information that can be provided. So that's why we begin to use these letters or different symbols to represent the numbers that we're trying to look for. So because of that, because these algebraic questions are very heavily equation centric, so we saw in the description that we just read that algebraic questions have everything to do with a bunch of equations, we really need to make sure that whenever we do algebra, we need to keep in mind the golden rule of mathematics, which would be the bid mass rule. Now, I'm sure you've heard of bin mass or bod mass, whichever version people use to um, remember the crucial order that, that you need to use whenever you tackle equations. Now, that would be that each of these letters represent a different thing. The B letter represents uh, brackets. The I represents indices. The D represents division. The M represents multiplication. The A represents addition. And finally, at long last, the letter S represents subtraction. So what this means is that we always start from the letter B going right to the letter S. So whenever you see algebraic equations, you must always do the brackets first, then your indices, then you can do your division and multiplication. It doesn't really matter which one you do first for those. And then finally, your addition and subtraction. Again, it doesn't matter if you do subtraction before addition, but just to make a nice acronym, bid mass is what you should remember. Now, uh, the other key thing is basically to think of algebraic equations kind of like the concept of balancing scales, where the scale in algebraic equations is the equal sign. So we always want to balance whatever is on the left-hand side of the equation to what is on the right-hand side of the equation. And if you fundamentally understand the concept of balancing things on the scale, then you can technically tackle every algebraic question you ever come across, including the more difficult ones that 
um, were given to us as an example, such as the simultaneous equations. So to get a really good understanding, it's always really helpful to try a sample question. Now, this sample question isn't obviously going to give us all the information for every single algebraic equation. So the big takeaway is to kind of get the technique that you use rather than the answer for this specific question. So what we see here in this example question is we're given two equations. One that says 7x minus 21 is equal to 4x and 6y minus 3y is equal to 9. Then it asks us which of the following statements are true. So the first equation states 7x minus 21 is equal to 4x. Okay, so going back to the fundamental concept of balancing scales, we want to have the equal sign here and have all the, the parts of the equation that has a letter, which are called pronumerals, such as this one and this one. We want all of them to be on one side of the equal sign. Now, the side that you choose is completely arbitrary. You can choose whichever side you want. But just for the sake of example, let's move the um, let's move the 4x over here to this side of the equal sign. So the way that you would do that is by taking away 4x from this side of the equal sign to get rid of the 4x that was originally present because 4x minus 4x is just equal to zero, so it's removed. But again, thinking about the concept of scales, if you take away something that was originally there, you take away this piece, then the scales have been changed. The scales would now tip over to this side. Now, that would be changing the original conditions, and we don't want to be doing that in algebra. We only want to manipulate rather than change. So we need to make sure that the 4x is taken away from both sides of the equal sign. That ensures that the, the original the scales remain balanced, so we don't change it at all. We've just kind of shifted it around a little a bit. So... Now we can see that the equation has now changed into 7x minus 4x minus 21 is equal to zero. Now, the other concept that we want to think about is that we want to make sure that all the pronumerals are on their own side and the numbers, the, the pieces of the equation without any letters, we actually want it to be separate on the other side of the equal sign. So again, we're going to do the same concept where we add 21 to both sides of the equal sign to get 7x minus 4x is equal to 21. Now, this is a much nicer format to deal with than the original format. And that's because all the letters with the, the letters, sorry, all the pieces of the equation with the letters are on one side and all the numbers are on the other side as intended. Now, what we can do is the concept of adding like terms. And that means if these pronumerals have the exact same letter in them, you can actually collect them and treat them as normal numbers. So in this case, 7x minus 4x gives us 3x is equal to 21. Now, again, to figure out what the x represents, we can divide both sides by 3. And that is because dividing both sides by 3 means that 3 divided by 3 is equal to 1. And that simplifies this complicated fraction into just x. And that tells us what this number is representative of. It's equal to 21 divided by 3, which we can simplify as equal to 7. So through all of that mathematics, we figure out that the letter x is used to represent the number 7. Now, looking at the answer options here, it does look like we do need to figure out what the, le the letter y is equal to as well. So let's quickly use the exact same concept to figure that out. 6y minus 3y is equal to 9. In this case, all the letters with the y is already collected on one side of the equal sign, so we don't need to do any shifting. We can just collect like terms. 3y is equal to 9, and so y is equal to 9 divided by 3, which is equal to 3. 
So now we actually know what these letters represent. Now all we need to do is see which one of these answer options are true. So for answer option A, x squared minus y squared is equal to 43. This would have been difficult if we didn't know what these letters represented. But now we do, so all we need to do is substitute these letters directly into the equation. So if you substitute x is equal to 7, we get 7 squared minus 3 squared is equal to 43. 7 squared being 49 and 3 squared being 9, we can see that this answer is equal to 40, not 43. So this answer option cannot be true. Taking the similar approach for option B, x plus y is equal to y minus x times by 5. Again, substituting in the values, we get 7 plus 3 is equal to 3 minus 7 times 5. Now, this hand of the equal sign is quite simple. We just add these two numbers together. But this side of the equal sign, we can see that there's multiple different operations being used. So we need to hear the rule of bid mass, which meant that we actually need to do the multiplication before the addition. So making sure we do that, sorry, I mean subtraction, not addition, we do this first. So 3 minus 7 times 5 is equal to 35. So 3 minus 35 would not give us 10, so this is not the correct answer either. Now for answer option C, again substituting in our values, y is equal to 3, y squared minus 2 equals to x is rewritten to 3 squared minus 2 is equal to 7. Now 3 squared is equal to 9 minus 2 is in fact equal to 7. So it looks like we found the correct statement. Now just to make sure, let's go through the other two answer options. 2y squared is equal to 36. Substituting in the y is equal to 3 gives us 2. 3 squared is equal to 36. Again, we've got a bunch of different operations going on here, so we need to make sure we make the adhere to the rules of bid mass, which says that we need to do the brackets first, then the indices, then the multiplication. So for here, We've got the indices right here. So we do that first before the multiplication. So this becomes 2 times 9, which is equal to 18, not 36. So this is incorrect. And finally, does x equal to y for option E? We definitely know that's not true. 7 does not equal 3. So we can quite confidently say that option C was the only correct answer. Okay, so hopefully that helped you walk you through the fundamental concepts of determining unknown questions for algebra questions. Hopefully this was of some help to you guys in answering similar styles of questions in the future. Thanks everyone for listening.